Good morning, friends. I'm Sandra Clay. I'm the pastor at Cooks United Methodist Church, and it is a glorious morning um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, because there it, it is beautiful. It's a beautiful blue sky uh, right in front of me, and the bird song is sweet. Uh, but most importantly, um, we get to spend some time in God's Word. Uh, that's what makes it so precious for me. And so we're continuing uh, this morning uh, in Psalm 139. Um, but I, ha I have to warn you, this is a difficult part of the psalm. S so what we're going to do is we're going to read these few verses from uh, verse 19 through 22. We're going to read these verses. And then I want to step back a little bit, just let the language sit with us. And let's talk a little bit about... Um, the presence of this kind of language in other parts of scripture but also what we as people who live on this side of the cross uh, can learn from those words written on the other side of the cross uh, so hope everybody's uh, doing great this morning uh, let's listen for God's Word uh, for us uh, again, Psalm 139, and I'm reading verses 19 through 22. If only, God, you would kill the wicked. If only murderers would get away from me. The people who talk about you, but only for wicked schemes. The people who are your enemies, who use your name as if there was no significance. Don't I hate everyone who hates you? Don't I despise those who attack you? Yes, I hate them through and through. They've become my enemies too. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now let's just say that uh, those words and words similar to them in, um, in Scripture are really hard for us to know what to do with. We, 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 we're wise enough to know that there was a context from which uh, and in which that those words were spoken and there's a reason why uh, both from humanity's side and from uh, the divine side that they've been included in the canon of scripture and so we have to have an open mind uh, and but also to use that thoroughly as we think through um, what indeed David meant by these words when he wrote this psalm. So uh, let's talk through um, a few things before we go back to the actual words. Uh, we need to recognize this, that the psalms um, are not in chronological order. Uh, they're not all written by David. Um, and there are several categories of psalms. And then there are subcategories of um, the kind of language that sometimes we find in them. For instance, it depends really on which scholars you follow. Uh, some would say there are five time, types of psalms. Some would say eight or even ten. Uh, and those are re that's really nitpicking about the kind of poetic language and stuff. So psalm the psalm, that word, is found uh, really in it, in the particular meaning it has in the Old Testament, only in the Old Testament, and psalm means melody. It's a, a song, a melody, written for uh, a harp or the plucking of strings, uh, harps, lyres, those kinds of instruments that were used um, in those earliest days. Uh, and so we make this concession kind of that uh, the, the psalms are all songs of sorts. And there are um, five different types that I, would sh that I would share with you, very general. There are psalms of praise, there are wisdom psalms, there are royal psalms uh, about the royalty of God, uh, there are thanksgiving psalms, and there are psalms of lament. This particular Psalm 139 was probably written about uh, uh, about a thousand, just a little 
over a thousand years from uh, before uh, Jesus uh, came and so probably written about the time that David uh, was made king so if you can imagine a shepherd boy who loves music who is uh, very good at the harp or the lyre uh, writing a song of praise uh, which we have already noted time and time again in the first 18 verses uh, a song of praise for God what in the world are these words doing there so here's one of those subcategories I was talking about this is called an imprecatory psalm or a portion of it imprecatory means um, uh, those words that curse our enemies, they invoke judgment, um, uh, 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 calamity is wished for or called for on those who are perceived as an enemy of God. And there are a lot of uh, Psalms um, that have this sub subcategory of language within them, uh, but there are no Psalms that are completely imprecatory there's always a word of thanksgiving or praise for God uh, and and then Psalm 139 many are like that where there are uh, far more uh, instances of praise and thanksgiving uh, but this language uh, li listen to some of these Psalm 69 let the table before them become a trap uh, Psalm 109, since he loved to curse, let it come back on him. Uh, Psalm 12, oh, you're going you're gonna to love this one. Uh, and again, this is common English translation. Psalm 12, let the Lord cut off all the slick talking lips. Uh, Psalm 40, let those who want to do me harm be humiliated. Y'all, we use imprecatory language, uh, whether it is intentionally di directed toward God. When we've been hurt, when we perceive either injustice against us or injustice in our world, doesn't our language reflect it? And so though we have difficulty uh, with it, it's important for us to hear this psalm and this portion of it on this day. Uh, so let's learn a little bit more. Uh, because uh, we have to be careful with the imprecatory language. It's um, uh, uh, not that it's out of line, but we, very, we have to be uh, very clear about two things. We have to be clear about who the enemy is. An enemy, uh, very simplistically, means the one who stands in opposition the one who would oppose me. Now we often think about the enemy as the one who would squash me, silent me, uh, stop me because of that opposition. Um, but we have to be clear who the enemy is. Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians that we are not fighting against human enemies, but against rulers, against authorities, against uh, forces of, car uh, of cosmic darkness, against spiritual powers of evil. Uh, and, and when we are hurt, it is very, very easy to clump together both the mouth who spoke the words and the evil that prompted the words. Now, that also means we have to make the concession. Sometimes what we said and what we did was our own intent and sometimes we let the blindness of our anger or our frustration allow the enemy, the prince of darkness, to use our tongue, to use our anger, to speak these words, uh, imprecatory words, about and toward another person. Does that make sense? We have to be very clear who the enemy is. The enemy is not a human being uh, as much as it is the evil that is reigning in that moment when that person or that group of people uh, come against God. And that is the language that, that uh, David is using here. We also have to be very careful that when 
uh, he's uh, when the imprecatory language in the Psalms is coming against another person we also have to give nod that if that's our mindset we're not excluded from that we could even pray those same words against ourselves and I know that we have when we feel so small because we have not done what we promised God that we we would do the language we wish on those who would who, who we see oppose God is true for us too so we have to be careful um, uh, about uh, all of this but these imprecatory words are important for us so let's kind of uh, look through uh, these uh, short verses and find some deeper meaning and um, understand David's heart and so understand our heart if only God you would kill the wicked if only murderers would get away from me uh, so okay so wicked shows up a couple of times and wicked uh, we we have that uh, meaning but we've used that uh, in our in slang language uh, in a common vernacular uh, that uh, carries many different meanings with it but wicked in the Hebrew language was uh, kind of criminal uh, evil uh, and by that I mean guilty of sin against God or against a person a, a, a hostility that intends to crush and so when David is praying if only you would there is a recognition too that God's not gonna do that David knows that's not God's way though there's been a lot of killing in the Old Testament I, David was a part of a lot of it that just wishing that God would slay all of those who would oppose him or oppose his people that that's not gonna happen if only you would kill the wicked do, just stop it for us if only God you would um, you would make sure that those who were um, who carry blood guilt with me murderer means the exact same thing and a death and murder are very different things very very different it's the intent of the one who causes uh, the death if only God you would now as people who live on this side of the cross we understand um, Jesus is called to join him in bringing the kingdom to be the kingdom of heaven is at hand um, and so we have responsibility in that we're not waiting for somebody else to do that God is using us to do that uh, second verse verse 20 the people who talk about you but only for wicked schemes the people who are your enemies who use your name as if it were of no significance I, I bet you're already thinking about what I did when I read this verse a little more slowly is one of the primary commandments is that we not take um, or use God's name in vain that's that's the power inherent in knowing and speaking another one's name uh, you, you don't get to um, we don't we don't get to define another person but we grant one another power when we allow each other to know our names God, God's given us that kind of power with God and it's very important that we not take the name of God in vain and this is what's ticking David off at this particular point the people what's hurting his heart what's really got him boiling here is those who talk about you but only for their own uh, uh, for what will uh, push their agenda the people who are your enemies and then he defines what he means by enemy you know the one that comes uh, that opposes or comes against it's those who use your name as if it were of no significance y'all know we've got to confess now that there are many times in the church I'm not pointing at you I'm just saying as a as a body often we talk church language so that other people think something about us but it really doesn't communicate our story more pointedly we talk about praying for people and we never pray the prayer 
We simply gossip about their problems. We talk church ease, but it doesn't really mean anything. It's all empty talk. So it's not just about using God's name in vain, but that's exactly what set David off. And so if those are enemies, and rightfully that's the definition of it, one who opposes God. I use God's name when I don't mean anything by it. God, when God's name comes across my lips, it doesn't feel any different than it than the name of any other uh, person or creature that I, I know. David is um, David's calling us all out, including himself. Don't I hate? everyone who hates you now I think that's where we really get tripped up I don't know if your mama taught you the same way my mama taught us but we you're not supposed to say the word hate it's it, it's too heavy it's too harsh it crushes it kills and hate in its purest definition really is just an intent not just but an intense dislike, a strong aversion. Okay, so it is true then that I hate rutabagas, but it feels like more than just a strong aversion when I apply that word toward what I feel toward another person. David is talking here uh, about people, but but he is also talking about the e the evil that perp is perpetrated against God and against God's desires, God's intent, the very kingdom of God, the way God orders things. He goes on, uh, David goes on to write in the remainder of that 21st verse, don't I despise or loathe intensely, I have an intense disgust for, don't I loathe those who attack you. Um, David is aligning himself with God, um, and maybe rightfully so. I know David wasn't perfect, and he did some horrible things that went against the very nature of God, yet he uh, is also recognized as one after God's own heart. David is you and me. No matter how hard we try, there are things that we have done that um, measure up to that phrase, attack. Remember in the very beginning of the psalm, uh, you know when I rise and when I lie down. Rise is not just to stand, it's about uh, rising for action. Here, it's attack is rise up against someone. Uh, particularly God. We're pretty good at thinking we know everybody else's motivation and defending God as if he needs my defense of him. Hmm. Don't I hate everyone who hates you? A am I not thinking clearly? Am I not thinking rightly? Is my heart not in the right place? And then finally, verse 22, that makes it even harder for us to say, yes, I hate them too. I hate them through and through. They've become my enemies too. Two closing thoughts that I think we've got to make peace with here, or at least be clear before we do the same thing that David has done here. I hate evil. And I hate the effect of evil at work in the lives of God's precious children. Um, it, it, in the circumstances that our nation is wrestling with right now, I hate the evil that snuffed out George Floyd's life. Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, the list goes on and on. I hate the evil that cost them their life. I also hate the evil that keeps us vilifying those who are responsible for their death and we make it about the person and not the pervasive 
evil that is all around us. Sometimes that we unwittingly nod to or participate in. Do, do you see what Dave, the, the dilemma of us receiving David's words? We have to be clear, my friends, about who the enemy is when our hearts are filled with imprecatory language. It could be us. It's supposed to be evil. It's supposed to be those forces beyond us that will never be as powerful or more powerful than God is. May we be clear as we pray the same kind of prayer that David did, um, that we are doing so in a very holy way. Now, uh, okay, so I lied. One more thing. L last word about holiness. These imprecatory words are holy, I believe, when we can remember who the enemy is, that, it, that God doesn't require of me to defend God's honor and character. What God asks is that I live by it, which only comes in submission to the power of the Spirit that I might stand um, as evidence, proof of the immeasurable love and grace of God, even though there is so much junk in my life. Uh, now, lastly, that, that third thought. When David writes, they've become my enemies too. That's less about them coming against David as it is David making the choice to name them his enemy. We have to be very clear. It's not uh, Billy Sue or uh, uh, whoever. It, it, it's not the name of the person who comes against us, but it is the evil that can co-opt the human heart used to come against one. I, I think David learned that full well, but how do you say all of that in a pretty song? H how do you say all of that uh, in a poem that's to express something deeper than just what spoken words can speak? If only, God, you would stop all of this mess. If you would, if you would stop all of those who are, who are hurting other people intentionally or just allowing their words to be co-opted by the evil one. I'm tired of listening to people use your name and not mean anything by it. Don't I hate, don't I loathe the same things, the same activity, uh, the same persons, I mean the way they behave as you? They, I choose them as my enemy too. Those are powerful words that we're not going to be able to wrap up in a 15 or 20 minute devotional, my friends. I, I hope that you won't shy away. Normally when we find verses we want to write on our hearts, uh, we don't choose verses like these. Uh, but there are certainly days when they are the ones that describe best what's in our heart and what's in our mind. So I hope that even on a beautiful day like today, that you will spend some time today thinking about what you have called God to do. What, what, what are the if onlys in your life? If only God, you would shut her up or you would shut him down. What, what are the if onlys that you have prayed and what is it that hurts you so bad that makes you want to lash out? Name the enemy for who it is. And then pray for your enemy. For that is what Jesus calls us to do. I, I just happen to have one thought kind of run through my mind for a second. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, had a, a very wise teaching about uh, imprecatory language in the Psalms and uh, the one who met his death because the Nazis were afraid of him and offended by him uh, ought to have a word for us about that. He just said um, uh, in his teaching about the Psalms and praying the Psalms would say 
that kind of imprecatory language, understanding who our enemies are and speaking um, of them to God, handing them over to God, leads us to the cross of Jesus and to the love of God which forgives. And so actually Jesus teaches us how to pray those imprecatory prayers of our hearts correctly. Forgive them, Lord, for they don't know what they're doing. That may be the hardest prayer we pray, my friends. Asking God to forgive because you know God is going to ask us to do the same thing. So, here's the challenge for today. Would you think about the things that um, you hold others hostage to? You're unforgiving. You see them as the enemy and some not, not, not the larger thing working in them. And then include yourself on that list. What is it that you need to forgive yourself for? Would you let God have that too? Let's, let's pray together. Lord, these words of David are hard. They're, they're hard for us to um, find reconciliation with because they're so harsh in print. But when the truth of the matter comes to light, we've prayed so many imprecatory prayers that it's almost embarrassing for us to now say out loud what we wish, if only you would do. We think of ourselves and the reasons behind those prayers as pretty high and mighty. Mostly it's just because we've been hurt and we're weary. Help us be courageous today, Lord, to think about what it is we hold people hostage for that we might then be able to remember who our true enemy is and extend forgiveness to those who just don't know what they're doing. We, we're the ones who find release, freedom, and peace in that. And so we ask, Lord, that you show us, too, where we need to forgive ourselves in those places where you've long forgotten, but we won't. Forgiveness is maybe the, be, uh, the most um, life-changing expression of grace that you ever offer. It can be the same way for us, too. So give us courage, Lord. Give us courage today and we say thank you in the name of jesus who won our forgiveness by love and grace we believe in you and we call your name today with love amen so glad to see you today look forward to seeing you tomorrow we're going to get to read the whole psalm together and remember that we are known and loved. Bye.